hometown screening. So uh, in the past when there's been a lot of people, we sort of introduced everybody. In this case, we're going to spare that. So if there's a specific question about a specific actor or a uh, score or whatever, we'll pass to them and they can introduce themselves then to speed things up a little bit. Wow. We got a lot so, of people here. Yeah, there's a ton. <laughs> come move over. Right? Uh, let's come on into the light, everybody. Uh, I'm Tyler Levine. I'm the producer. Uh, I'm Yeah, Tyler. Yeah. 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 Give me to thank a couple of people. First of all, I want to thank you guys. What a crowd, man. Holy crap. Yeah. Like, seriously. Yeah. It's probably the best festival crowd in the world, or? Uh, I've been to a lot of festival crowds. They're a pretty fucking good one. That's the truth. <laughs> You're a great crowd! Sure. <laughs> and, uh, I gotta start by just saying, Francois Dejeuner, if you like the autopsy, if you like the worms, where is he? Where is he? Yeah, where is he? One of his team had mind warp effects, Camille, Tracy, Francois, Humphrey. Way in the back. Come on down, Francois, thanks so much. <laughs> um, I want to thank my wife, Melissa Williamson, for staying up past her bedtime tonight. Uh, Leo, I can't thank you enough, man. I mean, we went to high school together, and the past couple days since we got back from LA, you've been compared to John Carpenter, you've been compared to David Cronenberg, and to be honest, nothing would make me happier in this world than for you to reach that kind of success. You really genuinely deserve it. Uh, I just took the room, so thank you, Amber, Andrew, uh, Michael, uh, Andrew Sheffer at Kojiko Fund. Thank you so much. Uh, our uh, eminent executive producer, Marty Cates, uh, Deirdre Bowen, who cast this film. How about this cast, guys? Right? The one thing that we've been hearing around the world about this film is that for a genre film, the acting is really amazing. And so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you for coming to Winnipeg in the middle of winter and not a single one of you guys complained. You guys are uh, phenomenal. Uh, I also want to thank our stunt coordinator, coordinator, Dan Skeen. Dan, are you over here? Yeah. Uh, come on down, Dan. <laughs> I'll keep moving into the darkness. Kevin and his brother, they, they risked their lives for this film, and I'm not exaggerating when they say that. And uh, Dan, and thanks, man, honestly. Um, Julia Rosenberg, uh, my good friend, uh, Kevin Proces, thanks God for helping us get through this. Uh, Caitlin, who we have a company of together. I am just prouder and prouder of her every day. Uh, I want to thank Randy Cooper at Wilmac Whites. You guys gave us an incredible Woo! deal on our equipment. Uh, how about the score? How about this the music? Right? Tom Weston, Asha, the entire big factory. Composer did an amazing job, honestly. And uh, I want to thank the guys at Red Lab, uh, Nick, Ahmad, Linda. I don't know if you guys are here, but uh, I know how hard to work and I know how little you got paid. So uh, <laughs> thanks so much. Uh, Jane, Peter, Tattersall Sound, uh, Isaac, Clements, and Phyllis Lang about Little Gals. I know it's cliche to say we went to battle together, and we did, and I wouldn't have to do it any other So, thank you. Uh, our financiers, uh, James Aitken, you're the best man, seriously. And Alan, uh, I can't, I, I, I don't even know what to say. Honestly, you came at the last minute and you saved our butt, so, so thank you. Man, to film the music, I hear a Greenberg Fund. John Galway, Alan Backus. Alan, I've got that email with you, I carry with me every day that you sent. Uh, it was an email between Leo and him in 2012. And finally, last, uh, but pretty damn far from least, Dan Lyon at Telephone. Dan, I know, uh, I was trying to think, like, what, maybe like 100 phone calls, 200, 300, maybe about 50 meetings. Every single one of them, you weren't just developing the film, but you were developing Leo and I. And uh, for the rest of our lives, we will be forever thankful. So, thank you very much. And now, uh, on to the yeah. All right. Why don't we just turn it straight to the audience? Because there's a lot of people, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions. And if not, I'll take over. But anybody? Wow, this is unprecedented. There's got to be one. OK, I'll start. Very simple question. Oh, wait, is there one? All right, there's one.
<laughs> so the uh, question is, why did Leo choose World War One and an infection theme to make this film? Um, great question. I, I, you know, I, at a personal level, um, my mom's family, uh, you know, in uh, she's English and her family's English, and they did, the, you know, the ancestors did fight in World War One. I've always found it particularly horrific. I think World War Two's been done. Um, and uh, not that it's been overdone, but it can continue to be done. But World War One has, it feels a bit underserved, I think specifically with a bit of the kind of rock and roll treatment, which we try to give it, the punk treatment. And, um, you know, um, I, I, I've stared at photographs at an aesthetic level, the vision and the horror of World War One for years. And, uh, and actually Matt, who's right here, um, you know, I pitched it to Matt, you know, almost four or five years ago, we were, we were, we were together somewhere, and I, and I mentioned it, and you know, and, and I'm going to give it to Matt here because uh, he's actually turns out he's like, well, you know, I was in the underground tunnels of World War One. Did you know that? And I was like, what the fuck? What? <laughs> and uh, Matt, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And but Matt has an unbelievable wealth of knowledge, and it kind of snowballed from there. I thought it was a, you know, I think uh, World War One is the uh, in a in a pretty negative way that birthplace of the 20th uh, century, and um, uh, it really opened up. Uh, Matt and I always talked about it as Pandora's box. My turn? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll speak quickly to that. Yeah, Leo and I had always sort of talked about the idea that if there was a more horrific setting for a horror, we, we didn't know what it was, and, and World War One really is that. In that we, we often look at World War One and we think, oh, it's this sort of pokey thing where these ancestors from three generations ago kind of languished in trenches, but it wasn't that way. It was the most modern, horrific, horrible war that humanity had ever seen. And so when the trenches sort of st like stalemate, as they say, the trenches sort of go this way, the world doesn't stop. They go down, they go up, they go in every other way they can. So they, there's a submarine war, there's an underground war like Burton's war, uh, there's an air war. It, really, the world we're living in now is World War One, and so we want to sort of use that as the most horrible situation that you could ever set a horror in. So we think that's what we well, last we tried to do. I, I would also say further that one of the key ideas that we always had was that um, um, it, it felt that World War One was like a contagion, and um, the way that it spread through the continent of Europe and then to the rest of the world. It felt very unnecessary. I think World War Two is like, look, you're dealing with Darth Vader, you have to deal with that. But World War One was like, nobody really needed to ultimately go there. And so Matt and I, from the very beginning, thought of it as a, a contagion, um, something that spread, and everybody just piled on. And so that was ultimately the kind of uh, source, uh, you know, that was the metaphor that we worked from. Maybe it might be cool to ask the actors, what was it like shooting in those sets? Uh, how actual contained was it? Were there pull away walls? Like how how like in there were you guys actually? Uh, well, our first day of uh, of shooting, we were, we were exteriors, at least, at least for myself. So it was one of these fun things where uh, I was supposed to be in Thailand, but instead I ended up in uh, Winnipeg in winter. And it was, no, but it was the most amazing thing, you know. Like you do, uh, I do a lot of theater, so a lot of you know used to playing make believe and running around in a silly costume, and now we get to do it outside and it's actually fucking cold and. You know, but it was such a great introduction to the world because it was just you kind of just show up and meet it. Uh, and then when we actually got to go underground, we'd already established these several days of exteriors kind of just suffering. Um, it was great because you know you don't really know people, uh, you know. So we got cast and we ended up kind of bonding by freezing to death outside in you know, all those beautiful, beautiful exteriors, and it created this you know this bond. This you know kind of brought us closer together and helped build that you know that dynamic. So after we had this kind of war setting, we got to go to hell and go underground. So it was this, uh, it was the way it was set up shooting wise, it was, it was perfect for that development. And if those anyone else wants to ask Those uniforms are not warm at all. <laughs> <laughs> they absorb a lot. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience? Oh, there's one over there. Is there? No? Yeah, it's right. Oh, the back there. Yep. Speak up, you're way back there. Yeah, you. Uh, no, I'm not question about the, was it CGI with the worms? Or like, and what's the background with that? With the worms for, it's World War One. Uh, yes, elaborate. The question is, were the worms CGI or how were they uh, pulled off? And um, what's why worms in World War One? Is there a background to that historically? <laughs> 
All the way down to Francois. Come this way, Francois. Come. So she makes these little bracelets out of these rubber bands. <laughs> They're essentially clear rubber bands. So we bought just hundreds of feet of these rubber bands and uh, we used them. <laughs> uh, it, uh, further to that, Francois, um, you know, it, my, my whole thing is I'm not pro or against CGI. I'm not pro or against practical, more or less. But I knew that uh, I just, for this project and for, I didn't want to do it and uh, CGI. And, the truth is that it's actually really, really hard to do to pull off these practical effects. It's it, it's it's almost becoming a lost art, and uh, and I the amount Tyler can attest to this, and Walter the amount of, of sort of existential suffering I went through to figure out how the hell on our budget and you know Francois I said this earlier I mean the guy's an artist and I know that you did this project for all the right reasons um, I know that you know we're gonna do another one where it'll financially be a different situation. <laughs> but it, 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 it also was pretty much one of the only guys around that, that has that, that art form that um, I think we're all, a lot of us Shaw fans are inspired from the kind of era of Rob Bottin and Sam Winston and a lot of those things. And I mean, Francois was downplaying it. Very few people can do what he can do. And uh, he, the guy is truly amazing. <laughs> are there any other questions from the audience? Nobody? Okay, there's one. I just, well, first of all, congratulations. It's an incredible film. Uh, just the claustrophobia of the sets. I, I didn't know that was like sets. So I was really curious how that was all built. And if that was in Winnipeg, I take it. Or did it look like it went to the real place? <laughs> so yeah, just a little, little more about that. So uh, the question is about the sets. Kind of the same question from two ago. Um, uh, yeah, they were, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the feedback. And, uh, uh, but yeah, they, uh, you know what, it's, it's like a classic kind of Roger Corman uh, situation. We, we had to build sets that were very small, and uh, we'd run one direction and then flip the camera, and they call it a French reverse, and run the other direction. And you just play those tricks that people have been playing for years before. I mentioned in the intro, you know, kind of Val Luton and Jacques Tourneur era. We've all been doing it, and if you don't have enough, then that's what you have to do. So the sets were remarkably not claustrophobic. Um, at all. Um, I wish they had actually been more just for the cast, but we had, we had to be very clever collectively. Um, all departments had to be very smart about how to maximize what we had um, and really kind of make that work. So I'm glad that you connected with us. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? Okay then. Uh, let me think. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the score. So I know there's five composers. Is it, is it a conglomeration, like a group of five different people that always write together, or...? Um, yeah, we're, we're a group called Grace and Matthews. We, um, we're actually a collection of about 10 composers. Um, and uh, just a quick shout out to Mark Dimitrik there, Igor Correa, who's here, Kevin Kruglo, uh, Ashley Dillon. Uh, big welcome to here, I'm a friend. Yeah, so I think one of the things there that was um, really important to us in early early days when Leo and I talked, we we wanted to. Um, he was very keen on having it uh, not be period um, score, which uh, which I thought was really exciting actually. Um, and so, and the idea of being, and you know, hopefully it kind of translated through. Um, there's never really like a there's never a, a constant tone. Uh, everything's always like dropping or falling or filtering or, or climbing, um, usually falling. 
God, that was violent. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so we, we we work as we work as a group. We collaborate, um, and um, usually with with one one vision, which can be tricky with a lot of people. But um, we just fight a lot, and then get it done. Awesome. Okay. Let's give them a huge round of applause for the cast and crew of the National Music Artifact. And remember, you can join with us at the pub. Go get drunk, say hello, introduce yourself. I'm sure they're going to be friendly. Thank you so much.